Here we are at the beginning of the new year, at the first Sunday of 2018. This is the time of year when we naturally pause to reflect over the last year and express hope for this new year. And like every year, when you look back on the past year, it's a mixed bag of good and bad. Unexpected things happen, some good, some bad. And it's the bad that we fear, especially because we have no idea what might come. So at the beginning of a year when who knows what might come, here's a promise from God. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 43, I'll be reading Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 3 from the New Living Translation. Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 3. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. The promise of God's presence, this is the greatest comfort we can ask for. The psalmist in Psalm 9 reminds himself who this Lord is that is with him. If you'd like to turn to Psalm 9 now, Psalm 9 verses 7 to 11. I'll be reading from the NIV, Psalm 9 Verses 7 to 11. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. When we fix our attention on God and what he has done, it transforms us. The Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians talks about the transformation that happens in us when we fix our eyes on Jesus, the Messiah. This is a wonderful promise for us in 2018. If you want to, um, you can turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21, but I will be reading from the message. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21. We don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, a new life burgeons. Look at it. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him, and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. How? You ask, in Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so we could be put right with God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How great is our God. And we learn about this God by reading our Bible. And for those of you that have read your Bible, uh, you would know and maybe noticed some of these things here that I'm talking about today. But for others of us that maybe haven't read the whole thing, it's interesting to note that the Bible uh, is primarily a series of stories. 
it really begins just by talking about real events. In fact, they really happened. There's way back when there were people called Abraham and then a son Isaac and Jacob. These were real people who lived in a real place and these events that they're described actually happened. They were kings of Israel as described in the Bible. Actually reigned. What's interesting to note about these stories is that they're not all nice stories. They're very realistic stories. There's good stuff and there's bad stuff going on in these stories. And as we read these stories, we also find out how God interacts with these good and bad events. And it's in watching and reading these stories and hearing how God interacted that we learn about who this great God is. And what he's like. And then we come to the New Testament. And again, they are describing real events. There really was a young girl named Mary who was visited by an angel. There really was a little baby that was born in a manger. There actually were wise men that came from the east. And they were looking for this new king. And this boy actually did grow up and become the rabbi Jesus. And he was crucified. It actually happened. And he rose from the grave. That actually happened as well. The whole Bible is a series of stories of real events. And then we come to the next book of the Bible. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. And these, again, are, are real events that happened in light of this resurrection. There were 12 disciples, and they did these events. And then there was a man named Paul that came to meet Christ. And he began to write letters, and much of our New Testament are letters, actually. He wrote to different groups of believers in different towns, Ephesus, Colossae, Rome, Corinth. But we'll notice in reading these letters that the writing style changes. Now, he usually begins his letters with theology about God. What do we know about this great God? We have wonderful chapters describing God in amazing ways in the church, what God's doing. But then if you'll read those letters carefully, you'll notice that usually toward the second half of the letters, he gets really practical. And he says, in light of how God has showed himself, that should show up in how we live. And he describes relationships between people. He talks about the kind of language that should be coming out of our mouth. He talks about a godly way that we should live out our sexuality. He talks about how to raise children. There's even one letter about what to do about a runaway slave. What emerges from this story when you look through the whole of the Bible is that the, the spirituality that's in the Scriptures is very practical. It shows up in the daily details of life. And so our preaching is not just theological, but our preaching also needs to have this practical side to it. And so today, I'd like to speak to you about a very practical matter. I want to talk about how our story, the good and bad of our story, interacts with God and what He is doing in our life, and that we, what we can do to understand and live within that. And that is a natural thing to do at the beginning of the year. We're at this time where we just had all the busyness of Christmas, and before things totally start up, school starts up in a little bit, we have this little pause between the old and the new year. And it's a time when we naturally think about the past year and we anticipate the coming. And we hope that things can be better in 2018. And we wish each other a happy new year. And we say all the best to you in this coming year. And New Year's celebrations are typically marked by exuberant joy and happy celebrations. Because we sense that one thing is finished and a new one is starting. And so it is like a chapter is just starting. 
And so I've entitled the message today, The Next Chapter. Now, some of you that are younger in the audience here, let's say uh, 12 and under, do you know what that picture is of? 12 and under, do you know what that picture is? What is that in the picture? It's a typewriter. Question mark. Typewriter? (laughs) That's right. It is a typewriter. That's an old machine that we don't even use anymore. You find it in museums now. But it's an interesting picture because in order for this chapter to be written, someone has to be pressing the keys to make this chapter happen. And I'd like to use that as a metaphor that when it comes to your next chapter, you are the author of your next chapter. This coming year, you are going to make decisions about what you're going to do this coming year. And you are going to be putting in the letters that's going to show up as your next chapter. The Bible teaches us that we have free will, which means that we get to choose. The Bible also tells us That free will means your choices have consequences. And so we begin to learn that some of our choices that we make have good consequences. Some of them have negative consequences. And so at this time when we stop and think back about last year, some things happen that you didn't choose. Maybe there was an accident. Maybe there was an illness or a death in the family. You did not choose it. You didn't put this into your letter. This, is, this wasn't your script that you wanted to have happen. And then there were choices that other people made that impacted your life. And so we're beginning to find out that this, this metaphor of writing our life story or of experiencing our life story is actually not that simple. It's actually rather complex because we don't have total control as to what comes into our chapter. When we think about it, there's actually a number of things. There's you, yes, your decisions, but then God does some things in our life. God, in His sovereign way, acts. And then there's other people that they act and their choices have consequences into our life as well. So in this, a little bit further reflection, we're finding out that we are not actually able to totally create our next chapter. We are invited to, but we don't have total control of it. We can influence the next year, but in the end, it's really ourself and God that have the proactive piece. Others are doing stuff that may be good or bad for us, but there is this mysterious element of us interacting with God to influence this next chapter. Now, I want to show you this in the Scriptures. If you were to turn to the letter to Ephesians, Paul wrote to these people in Ephesus, and in the fourth chapter, in verse 22, there's an interesting passage here which describes this mysterious interaction between what we are doing and what God does. And here's the verse. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Note the language that's used here. Paul is taking spiritual things, making them really practical. He's talking about a transformed life being made new. And there are two authors, there are two actors on this. The active command is in red. These are active commands written to us that we, you, are to put off some things and you are to put on other things. And then, in the blue letters, that's the passive tense. This is when it happens to us. We are made new. 
by God. But you'll notice in this transformation passage here, it requires our intentionality. We don't just sit around and ask God to change us. The Scripture here says that we are involved in this change process. That we have a responsibility to put off and to put on. Now, in the verses that go around this, Paul does delineate and he suggests some things you should put off and some you should put on. And that's quite the list. He says you should put off these kinds of things like deceitful desires and falsehood, anger and stealing and unwholesome talk and bitterness. Like, stop that stuff. Just put it off. And instead, put on speaking truthfully, honest work, generosity, upbuilding speech, forgiveness, these kinds of things. And the letter here that is written says that we are responsible to proactively do this kind of thing. So rather than sitting around and just saying, Lord, would you change me? Would you take away my anger? Paul is saying, you need to put that off. You need to step up and stop that stuff. Take some responsibility for your speech and stop that kind of talking. And instead, put this on and consciously do these things. And while you are doing it, God, in His mysterious way, is working on you, and He's making you new. But He's waiting for you and me to actively engage this process. So when we think about this coming new year, this, new, this next chapter, we should take this concept of putting off and putting on and saying, how does this work? When we do this putting off and on, here's where it happens. We take on an entirely new way of life. It's a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces His character in you. So here's the blue letters. This is the amazing thing that God is doing. While we are actively obeying the putting off and the putting on, God does this work in us. So in our next chapter, when we think about this year, There are some things that we should be thinking about putting off. And there are some things that we need to put on. And this is your work. This is the part of our lives that we need to take active responsibility for. So there's a couple of other ways of putting off and putting on. In other words, we could say, let's put it this way. In the next chapter, there are some things that should stop in your life. And there's some things that should start. And we are invited to enter into this and to think about it. What needs to stop in this coming year? What in your life should stop? And what do you need to start? And so these are both involved in change. Change involves stopping some things and starting others. One mistake that we can make is that in our New Year's time when we think about the coming year, we just, talk, we just think about starting things and we add more to our list and we simply keep adding. But the reality is <clears throat> that most of us are already so busy that we are maxed out And to be adding anything more is not likely to happen. There has to come some things that stop or change and some things that then start. So when we think of that list that Paul gave us, you know, the stopping stuff, it was all really bad stuff. And most of us would say, well, you know what? I don't want to do those things. I don't need to stop that because I'm not maybe doing that much. But I want to suggest to you that when it comes to evaluating what needs to stop and start in our life, if we want the best that God would have us do in 2018, we might have the harder choice of deciding what is best to do. And when we say a big yes to something, 
it will mean saying no to something else. And when it's a lot of good things that we're doing, but we're too busy, how do you go for the best? I want to suggest we take a look at this. Your next chapter, you, here's all the kinds of things that is surrounding us in our life. If we're going to be living, you're likely doing all these things. You've got a home that you're living in, and you have a relationship and people within that home. And as you think about your life, I want to suggest that you think prayerfully, Lord, what is it about my home and about what I'm doing that I should stop? And what are some things in my home that I should start? And just prayerfully consider that in this time of reflection. Most people will have some form of work. And as you think and pray about your work at the beginning of the year, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, what are some things that should stop at work? And what should start? You can think about your finances in the same way. Praying about your finances. What are some of the practices, Lord, that should stop and how I'm spending my money? And what are some things you would like me to start? And invite the Holy Spirit to teach you. Because the Bible is interested even in your finances. There's lots of Bible verses about money. This spirituality we're talking about is really practical stuff. Some of you are involved with school. You're school age. What are some things about school, that what you do at school, that needs to stop? And what are some things you should start? We often have outside activities, maybe sports and things. What should stop about that? Is there anything that should start there? What about church? Your involvement here at Bethel? What are some things as you pray about your involvement and your time here, what are some things that God might be prompting you to stop? And what might be He prompting you to start? Same with your hobbies. Friends, the relationships you have with people. What are some things you should stop about? What's going on there? Think and pray about your friendships. What should stop? What should start? And actively obey God's promptings. Now, what's really helpful is if you can do this with a journal. You just sit down with your pen and your paper, and you ask Jesus to talk to you about these things. And as you feel the impressions or you have the thoughts that come to you, just write them down. And just actively listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. As you do this, and you look at all the complexities of life, one thing becomes pretty obvious, and that is we are busy people. And there's a lot of good things we want to do. In fact, there's way more good things than what we can ever do. There's more good that you want to do than you can. And we come to this really hard piece of prioritization. What is most important in each of these areas? You can't do them all, but what's most important? What's the most important thing that should happen at home? Maybe you'd like to start five new things, but what's the most important one? Maybe two, but no more than that. What's the most important thing about balancing all these things? You may have to say no to some very nice things, some good things, because your priority is higher than just trying to do everything. When we try to do it all, we end up stressed. We end up not being able to do it all. Another practical thing then is to put all this into some form on your calendar. How are you going to live out what God has been saying to you? Because if you don't fill your calendar, someone else will. And you might end up living a life that you hadn't intended. But at the beginning of the year is the time when we naturally are wishing that things could be different in 2018. And the Scripture invites us 
to put off and to put on. And in the process of doing that, the miracle happens that you end up taking on a new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life that is renewed from the inside and begins to work itself out into your conduct as you listen to God and He begins to reproduce His character in you. I think that is a wonderful New Year's prayer. And I invite us to pray that. Let's just pause to pray. Oh God, when we read the Scriptures, we see how interested you are in the details of our life. You care about how we raise our kids. You care about how we spend our finances. You care about the relationships we have with people. You care about how we work. And you want your Holy Spirit to come and shape us from the inside out in all of these areas. And Father, I pray for these your people that hear the sound of this message. Lord, I pray that the aspirations that we sense in our heart, our desire that 2018 can be something different, can be fanned into flame by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we will actively listen and by your grace put off some things and put on what you're prompting us to do. And Lord, we want to be obedient. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Look at what the Scripture says. Now, God has given us the task of telling everyone what He's doing. We are Christ's representatives. And God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. May that be true for you in 2018. Amen.